Hey everyone, it's Dr. Mark Hahn. Hope everyone had a really good break. We are starting back up with our lectures. First, we're going to talk about the cardiovascular system, and our first lecture will be on blood. So the cardiovascular system has three main components. The three main components include the heart, uh, our vessels, as well as blood. Now cardiovascular, when we break this word down, cardia means heart and vascular means vessels. So another functional name for cardiovascular system is the circulatory system because we know that the vessels are a way for the blood to circulate throughout the body. Notice the spelling of cardia is with a K. This is actually the German spelling, and we get the K in EKG from the German spelling. So an EKG and ECG are actually the same thing. Both uh, are electrocardiograms, and they measure the electrical conductivity of the heart. So we know that blood performs several essential functions. The first and probably the most important function is transportation or transport. So we have the transport of gases such as nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. We also have the transport of nutrients including amino acids, glucose, and lipids. We talked about cell-to-cell -cell communication earlier in the semester. So we know that blood uh, performs transport of signaling molecules such as our hormones that are secreted from glands and will transport be transported throughout the blood to effector organs or effector cells. Blood is also important for the transport of water as well as the transport of waste products of metabolism. Another essential function of blood is protection. Blood contains important cells needed for our immune systems. So these cells protect us from invaders, including pathogens such as bacteria, or hopefully um, any incoming viruses such as the current coronavirus. The cells within blood also um, have the function of clotting. So clotting, such as uh, thrombocytes that are important for clotting, help prevent blood loss. Another important function of blood is temperature regulation. Blood helps us maintain a core temperature range. So we can see that um, when we run around in the house, if we're stuck inside the house, we become hot, blood will go to the skin to help dissipate this heat. Now, if we're cold, for example, it's been chilly the last couple of nights and you've been sleeping with the window open, our blood will help um, keep us warm by staying within our core. Now there is a phenomenon called Raynaud's phenomenon, and you can actually see that in this picture here. Raynaud's phenomenon is actually triggered by extreme cold temperatures. It's a hyperactivation of the sympathetic nervous system, it causes extreme vasoconstriction of peripheral blood vessels. So we can see a distinctive discoloration of the fingers here, whereas the hand maintains a red kind of color, and that is Raynaud's phenomenon. Other general characteristics of blood, blood is made up of about 50% of water and has a 0.9% salt content. It also has a pH range within a neutral type of pH range from 7.35 to 7.45. Now we know that venous blood is actually on the low end of that pH range because of the carbon dioxide content. Now blood is made up about 60% of liquid, and this is in the form of plasma, plasma being a non-living fluid matrix. The solid um, content of blood is are the formed elements, which make up about 40%. These are the cells. So we have our red blood cells, RBCs, or our erythrocytes. We also have our white blood cells, WBCs, also known as the leukocytes, and we have platelets, again, important for clotting. Now, blood is a highly viscous fluid. What does that mean? Viscosity can be described as thickness or stickiness of a fluid. So blood is highly viscous, meaning it's kind of thick and sticky. Now, uh, the benefit of that is 
it's it's helpful in avoiding blood loss. The downside is that if it is too thick or sticky, it might be difficult to circulate. Now we know that smoking, for example, increases the viscosity of blood. If we have an increase in viscosity, meaning an increase of thickness or stickiness, this would cause an increase in blood pressure because it takes more pressure to kind of push this thick, sticky blood throughout our blood vessels. This causes hypertension. Now, water constitutes the majority of total body weight. Uh, we can see there are different percentages of totally, total body water content um, depending on your age range. For example, infants, um, their total body water percentage is about 80%. A middle-aged individual would be about 60%. And elderly people, they are made up of about 55% of water. Now you'll hear about uh, a description of a magical, mythical male. Um, this type of male uh, we consider as a reference male. So this person or this male weighs about 70 kilograms or about 154 pounds. So what they're saying is the typical male is roughly 154 pounds. Uh, this standard value was actually derived from the data published in 1984 by a group called the Inter International Commission on Radiological Protection, or the ICRP. Now, at the time, they were setting the guidelines for permissible radiation exposure to, to people. And they selected a young, white, European male who weighed about 70 kilos, which is equivalent to 154 pounds, as their reference man. They then determined that he has to have a reference woman. Now, this reference woman, of course, was also young uh, uh, and weighed about 58 kilos or 127.6 pounds. Now, we all know that the population of the United States has gotten a lot larger and heavier since then. I mean, for me, the last time I probably weighed 127 pounds was probably high school. Anyways, so 70 kilograms is equivalent to about 154 pounds. If we know that this individual, or this, this reference man is about middle-aged, 60% of his weight is what will make up his body water percentage. So 60% of 70 is 42 kilograms. Um, one kilogram is about equivalent to one liter of water. So 42 kilograms equals 42 liters. Now the body contains several fluid compartments. We have the intracellular fluid. So this is the fluid that is contained inside the cells. Uh, this makes up about 28 liters. Of fluid or two-thirds the uh, total amount of fluid. We also have extracellular fluid or ECF and this is the fluid found outside the cells and this is made up of 14 liters um, of fluid, so about one-third. Now we know that extracellular fluid is composed of the interstitial fluid, um, fluid within the interstitium, and this makes up about 10 to 11 liters of the 14 liters. Plasma makes up about three liters. And then we have transcellular fluid. Okay, so we can see by this figure, our intracellular fluid is um, here. And this is again the fluid inside the cells. And then we have our extracellular fluid. Again, this is the fluid contained outside the cells. Uh, this picture really isn't a fair representation of the amount of fluid and where the fluid is contained because we know that the majority of the fluid is again found inside the cells. About 28 liters or two-thirds the amount of fluid is contained within the cells, whereas only about a third of our fluid is contained um, outside of the cells in our plasma as well as in the interstitial fluid. Now, total blood volume is equal to plasma, plasma again being that non-living fluid matrix, plus formed el elements, these formed elements being our blood cells. So total blood volume 
is roughly 5 to 5.5 liters. So our body is made up of about, or our, our total blood volume makes up about 5 to 5.5 liters. Now we know that blood volume does vary with body weight. Uh, the best estimate of blood volume uh, is about 8% of our body weight um, is our blood volume. So for example, if you're a Star Wars fan, we know that, well, we don't really know, but we can estimate that Jabba the Hutt was roughly 1,000 kilograms. Uh, so 8% of 1,000 kilograms would be his blood volume. So 8% of 1,000, so 80 liters would be his blood volume. Now, Salacious Crumb. Salacious Crumb was this, was this Kuwaitian monkey lizard uh, who kind of acted as like the court jester to Jabba the Hutt. Salacious Crumb, we're going to say, weighs about 20 kilos and 8% of 20. So his blood volume would be 1.6 liters. And then we see Ula, poor Ula. Ula served as the slave to Jabba the Hutt and did not meet such a great end. So Ula, we're going to estimate her weight to be about 60 kilos. So 8% of 60, her blood volume, we can estimate to be at 4.8 liters. So we can centrifuge blood to separate blood into his com its components. So centrifuging blood involves placing blood into a test tube. We then place this test tube in a machine that spins these the test tubes around and separates blood into uh, its components. So we can see, if we look at a test tube that has been centrifuged, we can see that the top layer right here is the plasma. Again, plasma being that non-living fluid matrix. Plasma makes up about 58% of blood volume. Separating the plasma from the red blood cells is this pale uh, buffy coat. Now this buffy coat is actually made up of the white blood cells. So white blood cells include uh, leukocytes, as well as platelets. And then below this buffy coat are the packed red blood cells. So red blood cells, also known as erythrocytes, um, make up about 95% of all the formed elements. But here in this test tube, the uh, red blood cells make up 42% um, of this test tube. Now we actually use this uh, column of red blood cells uh, to measure hematocrit. Now hematocrit is the ratio of red blood cells to plasma and is expressed as a percentage of the total blood volume within the test tube. Now after we centrifuge the test tube, the column of packed red blood cells is measured and then reported as a percentage. Normal range for men for hematocrit is about 40 to 54 percent and for women it's about 37 to 47 percent. So we measure hematocrit to help get a clinical idea of the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood and also can help us identify any underlying conditions such as anemia. So the blood components again that we find, so we have our red blood cells, um, there are roughly about 5 million red blood cells per microliter, and the function of our red blood cells is to transport or carry oxygen. White blood cells, also known as leukocytes, uh, numbers are anywhere between 5,000 to 10,000 cells per microliter, and the main function of our white blood cells, of course, is immunity. Then we have our platelets, also known as thrombocytes. These are our clotting cells. Platelets number anywhere from 200,000 to about 400,000 cells per microliter. Again, the important function of our thrombocytes are for clotting. Now, plasma is primarily composed of water, and plasma makes up about 50 to 60% of whole blood. 
So plasma is, again, the non-living fluid matrix of the blood where cellular elements are suspended. Proteins account for about 8% of plasma, and we see that the majority of plasma is uh, 90% and above of water. And then 8% of plasma includes proteins. So uh, these proteins include albumin, which is a major contributor to plasma colloid osmotic pressure. We have our gamma globulins, um, which include clotting factors, enzymes, as well as antibodies. Uh, fibrinogen, which is essential for blood clotting. And we have protein carriers. These protein carriers um, allow for the transport of steroid hormones, cholesterol, drugs, as well as certain ions such as iron via the protein transferrin. Now the remaining 1% is dissolved organic molecules such as amino acids, glucose, lipids, as well as nitrogenous wastes. Um, ions include sodium, potassium, chloride, hydrogen ions, and calcium. Uh, trace elements and vitamins as well as dissolved gases such as oxygen and carbon dioxide. So this makes up the remaining one to two percent of plasma. Now a lot of people confuse the word plasma and serum. Serum is actually plasma without the clotting factors. So if you ever have any confusion know that um, Again, serum does not contain any clotting factors. Now the first protein that we're going to talk about is albumin. Albumin is actually a critical osmotic regulator and we'll get into that in just a little bit. So yes, there are different types of plasma proteins, but basically all will do the same thing. Now, the liver makes most plasma proteins and will secrete them into the blood. We know that albumin is actually the most prevalent of all the plasma proteins, making up about 60% of the plasma proteins. We know that uh, albumin actually will help increase the viscosity of blood, again, increasing that uh, characteristic of thickness and stickiness of the blood. We know that um, albumin also is important in contributing to osmotic pressure, specifically colloid osmotic pressure. Now, what is that? So we talked about um, there are two forces that actually regulate the bulk flow or movement of fluid into and out of our capillaries. So one force is called hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure will actually push fluid out the capillary pores into the interstitium or into the tissue. Now another pressure is osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure is actually determined by the solute concentration of a compartment. So osmosis, we talked about the uh, the movement of water. So the main solute difference between plasma, which is um, in the capillaries, and interstitial fluid is due to the presence of proteins. Um, so these proteins are present in plasma but are mostly absent from the interstitial fluid. So this causes an a solute concentration gradient. So there are more plasma proteins in in the plasma, but not in the interstitial fluid. So where is water going to go? Water is going to go where there is more, uh, where there's more stuff, where there's proteins. So the presence of proteins in the plasma makes the osmotic pressure of the blood higher than that of the interstitial fluid. So again, this osmotic gradient will actually pull water from the interstitial fluid into the capillaries and then we'll also offset the filtration out of the capillaries created by blood pressure. So water is being pulled back into the capillaries. This is actually a way of preventing edema. So again, the osmotic pressure created by the presence of these proteins in the plasma is known as colloid osmotic pressure. And this is also known as oncotic pressure.
if we have a situation we have where we have hypoproteinemia, meaning low protein in the blood, uh, that means that there are no proteins in the plasma, so we can't pull fluid back from the interstitium into the capillaries. And what will happen? So fluid will go into the tissue and create edema, and this is when we have low protein in the blood. So here we can actually see a picture, um, the differences between the two legs. Here we see swelling, a swelling occurring in one leg. Um, this is uh, a sign of edema. Edema can also occur in um, women who are pregnant. Um, and just if there's low protein in the blood, this actually pre prevents the pulling of fluid back into the capillaries. So fluid goes into the tissues causing edema. Another type of plasma protein are, I'm sorry, another type of proteins are um, gamma globulins. Gamma globulins are actually very essential for the immune response. Uh, gamma globulins are a subclass of our serum proteins. Um, they are named based on how they migrate during electrophoresis. And we have um, immunoglobulins or antibodies that are a type of gamma globulin. So immunoglobulins or antibodies are synthesized and secreted by specialized blood cells rather than by the liver. These cells, also known as lymphocytes. Um, we know that immunoglobulins and antibodies are very important to provide protection from foreign invaders. Um, gamma globulins or immunoglobulins are the most varied blood protein in that they are very specific antibodies that are created for each invading pathogen. Now, if we look at this picture, this is actually a picture of a typical antibody. So the structure of the antibody includes light chains. So these outer chains right here are called light chains. So there are the light chains. And then the inner chains are called heavy chains. Okay. So we have the outer light chains and the inner heavy chains. The amino terminal of the antibody we can see right here. This is also known as the antigen binding fragment or the FAB. So this is actually the variable part of the antibody that is, as we can see, made up of both parts of a heavy chain and a part of a light chain. Um, so this variable part of the antibody is what recognize specific antigens. The other part of the antibody is called the constant fragment right here. So the constant fragment made up of a constant light chain and a constant heavy chain, this cost constant fragment, also known as the FC, has a carboxy terminal. Um, it's this part of the antibody that will determine the isotype of the immunoglobulin, meaning whether it's an IgM, IgG, IgD, IgA, or IgE. So again, immunoglobulins are a major class of gamma globulins. Not all immunoglobulins are gamma globulins, and not all gamma globulins are immunoglobulins. We do have different types of gamma globulins. So with regards to variation, um, we have genes that um, allow for specific parts of the gene to basically uh, determine the, the variation of the antibodies. We have sites called VDG sites on the gene. And these V as in Victor, D as in dog, J as in Jack, these VDG uh, parts of the gene um, undergo recombination. And this recombination allows for diversity and variation of the antibodies to allow for binding of specific antigens. Now, somatic recombination of these genes, somatic meaning occurring within the cell, um, is, again, what allows for uh, the variation. 
Um, so the variable region is encoded in several pieces. We have variable V, uh, diversity D, and joining J. So that is our VDJ. Multiple copies of the VDJ gene segments actually exist and are tandemly arranged um, by the developing B cell, B cell being the B lymphocyte. So the B cell will then assemble these different regions randomly um, and will select and combine one V, one D, and one J gene segment. And these different combination of gene segments will be used um, to generate a huge number of antibodies. Now, after a B cell produces a functional immunoglobulin, uh, it cannot express any other variable region. Um, this is also known as allelic exclusion. So each B cell can produce antibodies containing only one kind of variable chain. Okay, so one antibody um, binding to a specific pathogen. Another type of plasma protein um, is fibrinogen. Now, fibrinogen is a soluble precursor. It's very important for blood clotting. Uh, during the coagulation pathway, a chemical signal allows for the formation of a specific enzyme called thrombin. Thrombin will then convert fibrinogen into insoluble fibrin polymers that will become part of a clot. So fibrin coming... Um, again being formed by the conversion of fibrinogen via the enzyme thrombin will form that net for clots to form on. So here we can see that pinkish uh, stringy like structure which again uh, helps form clots. We also have carrier proteins. A carrier proteins are necessary to help transport hydrophobic molecules. Um, carrier proteins transport hydrophobic molecules in aqueous blood, including cholesterol, uh, steroids, which are cholesterol derived, as well as free fatty acids. Um, these carrier proteins we've heard of, we've, called, we've heard of our LDLs, as well as our HDLs. Um, LDLs, if you think L starts, you know, the word lousy starts with L, so these are our lousy um, carrier proteins. Whereas when we do a blood test, testing for um, our different fats and cholesterol, we want high HDLs, HDLs being our happy uh, lipids. So LDL stands for low density lipids, HDL stands for high density lipids. Again, these are uh, carrier proteins that will help transport uh, either cholesterol, steroids, or free fatty acids. Other transport proteins or carrier proteins um, can regulate the available levels of certain molecules. For example, the carrier protein transferrin. Transferrin can control the level of free iron. So this slide just shows a summary of blood characteristics. So blood um, has a 0.9% salt content, has a neutral pH range um, between 7.35 to 7.4 or 7.45, is highly viscous, again, has that property of being thick or sticky. Um, blood also is made up, or blood volume is 8% of total body weight. Um, blood characteristics or blood functions includes transport, protection, as well as temperature regulation, contents of blood. The liquid portion of plasma um, is about 60% made up of water, proteins, as well as other um, ions, gases, and nutrients. So water making 90% of plasma and then proteins making up about 8%. And then we have our solid content of blood, which are our formed elements or our blood cells. 
Um, this includes our RBCs, our WBCs, and our platelets. So where is blood produced? We know that red bone marrow produces most blood components. Red blood cells are produced by red bone marrow. White blood cells are made up, are produced by red bone marrow as well as lymph tissue and platelets again um, are produced in the red bone marrow. Now in adults, bone marrow um, and blood cell production are produced mainly in the pelvis, uh, spine, ribs, cranium, as well as the proximal ends of long bones. Active marrow is red because of the presence of hemoglobin, hemoglobin being that oxygen binding protein of red blood cells. Inactive marrow is yellow, and this is due to the abundance of adipose tissue um, or fat. Now, in the regions with active bone marrow, about 25% of the developing cells are red blood cells, and 75% are destined to become white blood cells. And this is because the lifespan of white blood cells is relatively shorter compared to red blood cells, so um, white blood cells have to be replaced more often. So all blood cells are derived from a single progenitor, meaning all blood cells are descendants of a single precursor cell type. This precursor cell type is known as the pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell uh, that we can see up here. So the pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell. This cell type is found primarily in the bone marrow and then can develop into many different cell types. Now, as the cells specialize, they narrow their possible fates. So they will, uh, the pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell will then become an uncommitted stem cell. Um, the uncommitted stem cells will then become progenitor cells that are committed to developing into one or more cell types. So progenitor cells differentiate into red blood cells, uh, lymphocytes, and other white blood cells, as well as megakaryocytes, so megakaryocytes being the parent cell of the platelets. Hematopoiesis just means the synthesis of blood cells. Now scientists have been working to isolate and grow uncommitted hematopoietic stem cells to use as replacements in patients whose stem cells have been destroyed by cancer chemotherapy. We know that cancer chemotherapeutic drugs have been known to wipe out both abnormal and normal cells. So hematopoietic stem cells, also from umbilical cord blood, can be used for transplant in patients with hematological diseases such as leukemia. Now, certain chemical factors do encourage differentiation of stem cells into their destined cell types. Erythropoietin, or EPO, is actually to, considered to be a hormone that allows for differentiation of stem cells into erythrocytes. Erythropoietin is produced in the kidney, and it is induced by low levels of oxygen in the tissues. Red blood cell production um, is known as erythropoiesis. So here we see our pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell becoming the uncommitted stem cell. And in the presence of erythropoietin, um, we have production of our urethrocytes. So a lot of athletes, specifically um, those who uh, ride bikes, or other athletes, they do most of their training um, at high altitudes. Uh, these high altitudes actually stimulate erythropoietin production because, again, a stimulus for uh, EPO synthesis and release is hypoxia, hypoxia being low oxygen levels in tissues. Air at higher altitudes has less oxygen, and by stimulating the synthesis of red blood cells, EPO puts more hemoglobin into the circulation to carry oxygen. So basically, 
these athletes want to increase uh, the amount of red blood cells in their blood uh, so that they can carry and transport more oxygen to their tissues, allowing their muscles to function better. So scientists within, within the 1900s were actually able to produce synthetic erythropoietin. Um, and we know that synthetic EPO does stimulate red blood cell production. Um, so, you know, those athletes not wanting to do the work can actually use synthetic EPO. So in the 1980s, a recombinant human EPO was produced. Uh, the company Amgen um, produced Darby Poetin. Darby Poetin actually binds to the erythropoietin receptor on erythroid progenitor cells, which does stimulate RBC production and differentiation. So it actually acts as a synthetic agonist to increase, increase uh, red blood cell production. But there are consequences. Now, while synthetic EPO does stimulate RBC production, uh, it was determined as a banned substance because, again, it's a drug that was produced synthetically um, and gave other athletes an edge over those that didn't take drugs. So an example of this is the 2002 Salt Lake City Olympics. We have um, a co cross-country skier represent representing Germany. No, uh, his name was Johann Mulig, with a little umlaut over the U. So he won three gold medals um, and then tested positive for synthetic EPO after winning his first two gold medals. Now, originally, the last one was taken away um, because of the pres presence of synthetic EPO, but the inch, so the International Olympic Committee initially let him keep his gold medals from the first two races. However, in December 2003, they later took all the golds away, um, and it was found that more than 100 athletes tested positive for blood doping. Now, another chemical, um, thrombopoietin, does create platelet-producing uh, cells. So platelets are actually cell fragments from a megakaryocyte. So here we see pluripotent hematopoietic stem cells, which become uncommitted stem cells, and in the presence of thrombopoietin uh, will become megakaryocytes, and uh, platelets will then um, break off as fragments coming from the megakaryocyte. So here we see um, leukocyte production does involve two chemical signals, first being leukopoietin. Um, so in the presence of leukopoietin, first the pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell uh, will become the uncommitted stem cell and then leukopoietin will actually allow this cell to eventually differentiate into leukocytes. We also have another chemical signal coming from colony stimulating factor or CSF. So CSF actually does stimulate the growth of different leukocyte colonies. Um, we have signals called cytokines. Cytokines are peptides or proteins released from one cell that affect the growth or activity of another cell. So we can say that colony stimulating factor is a type of cytokine. Uh, CSF is actually made by endothelial cells, marrow fibroblasts, and leukocytes uh, that regulate leukocyte production and development, also known as leukopoiesis. Now CSF does induce both cell division through mitosis as well as cell maturation in stem cells. So here we see the, with the presence of these two chemical signals, we then have the production of our leukocytes such as our neutrophils, monocytes, basophils, eosinophils, and lymphocytes. So bone marrow produces three times more white blood cells than red blood cells, as I've said earlier. Um, so the cells produced 
out of the cells produced, 25% will be red blood cells and 75% will be white blood cells. And this is because, again, white blood cells have a shorter lifespan compared to red blood cells. For example, neutrophils. Neutrophils have about a six-hour half-life, so the body actually must make more than 100 million neutrophils each day to replace those that die. Um, and then we have uh, red blood cells. Red blood cells actually live for months in circulation. So we don't need as many red blood cells to be, to be produced compared to white blood cells. So as a summary, hematopoiesis, again, is the synthesis of blood cells. Um, here we see that the majority of our blood cells come from a single uh, pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell. Say that five times fast. Um, red blood cells and platelets only require one signal, that being erythropoietin. Um, here, thrombopoietin actually allows for the cell to become a megakaryocyte and then a platelet. Whereas the rest of the white blood cells require two signals, that being leukopoietin as well as the cytokine colony stimulating factor. And the production level within the bone marrow, about 25% of those cells are red blood cells and 75% of those cells are white blood cells. Okay, so that's part one of the blood lecture. Part two will be coming up next.